Welcome to Chill Skills Orland Tech Talks. The topic for this session is supermarket high side components, three way heat reclaim and split condenser valves. This is the first in a series of presentations that will follow the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. In the past, Sporlin had a team of professionals, that means real smart guys, uh, on a supermarket team that used to travel around the country and facilitate these presentations, but we could only get to so many people at one time. With this Tech Talk entry, we're bringing the supermarket seminar concept back and hopefully servicing a bigger audience in the process. Again, Thank you all for joining us. And oh gosh, before we even get finished with this presentation, here we are putting in a shameless plug for the next one. Uh, December 18th, 2019, we'll cover supermarket high side components, head pressure control valves. So a uh, shameless promotion for that before you get done with this one. But that's kind of the way we, we fly here. A, a couple of things to note, if you're joining us this webinar via a Zoom, I had never heard of Zoom before this, so Zoom, Zam, Zoom. Zoom it, it, yeah, yeah, there you go. If you do not have sound on your computer, you can dial in. Uh, please mute your microphone. Uh, type your questions in the question and answer window. And if you're joining this webinar via Facebook Live, it kind of looks like Facebook Live to me, but you can type your questions in the comments. This webinar will be recorded, so they told me I got to watch what I say. Uh, you can watch it again on Sporland's YouTube channel called Sporland Video. I think Sporland Vision would have sounded a lot, a lot cooler, but you know, hey, whatever. I, they didn't ask my opinion. on. Well, here's the two old dinosaurs that are doing this today. Uh, <laughs> hello, I'm Jim Jansen. I'm the, I'm the pretty guy on the left that looks like uh, Santa Claus just shaved his beard. Uh, I'm a senior application engineer for the Sporland application team. I guess that makes sense. Application engineer, application team. And and joining me is... I'm Jim Camp, and I'm his sidekick for the day. What a deal. So we're two of the senior application engineers. If you have any questions or feedback for us, you can always send us an email um, or you can contact Sporland Technical Support directly at svdtechsupport at parker.com. Um, or you can always resort to the telephone and call us. We got a number, 636-239-1111. We'll show all this information again at the end, but we've actually got humans here in Washington, Missouri that will help you with problems and help you resolve them. So you can call us. We got lots of smart guys that if they can't answer your question, they'll make something up. So you'll be happy with it either way. <laughs> The basic refrigeration system vapor compression cycle. Here we got the, the main components depicted in this schematic that's in front of you right now. So what are those fire, four primary components? Well, here they are highlighted. There's a compressor, uh, the two main heat transfer surfaces, the condenser and the evaporator. And then there's always some type of expansion device or metering device that works in unison with the compressor. And these four components make everything work. And we're going to start dealing with just bits and pieces of this as we make our way around this system with this series of supermarket seminars that we're gonna do with the Sporland Tech Talk series. Here is a depiction of a supermarket rack. Uh, the modern refrigeration system can be pretty complicated and each one can really be different, you know? That's for sure. Uh, some installations have multiple and distributed racks throughout a store, you know, supermarket. Other designs include one or more compressor racks in a mechanical room with split suctions intended to handle both low and medium temp refrigerated cases. And these systems may include different refrigerants. And boy, isn't that a case in point, because sometimes they got different refrigerants that they didn't even want because every time a service contractor comes out there, they might put a different refrigerant on top of the one that's already there. And then condenser types and compressors can be unloaded and loaded. And I'm not talking about taking them off the truck. I'm talking about they might have, you know, those devices that help control capacity, mm -hmm. yeah. subcoolers, heat reclaim and all that kind of stuff. And you can see in this system, if you look real close, uh, compressors, control panels, an oil separator, an oil reservoir, an oil filter, an oil level control. There's even an example of some of our differential valves in there. This particular system 
is in our engineering lab here in good old Washington, Missouri. Oh my gosh, look at this. A DX system, multiplex racks. That's complicated. Looks complicated. Oh gosh. Uh, but if you look real close, you'll see, see those four main components again. Compressors, condensers, evaporators, metering devices. And, and today, we're going to talk about this part of the system. We're going to, uh, over time, we're going to make our way through the whole system. But today, we're going to begin with the compressor outlet and move right on to high side components, just like the old supermarket seminar series used to do. So here we go with high side components, the heat reclaim valve. The condenser is located on the high side of the system is, and is connected to the discharge line. It sort of sounds like the knee bone is connected to the shin bone thing, but I don't think that was part yeah, of this. Yeah, I think that's a different story. Yeah, it's a different there. story. And, uh, installed near the condenser may be a heat reclaim and split condenser valve along with some head pressure controls. Now, the heat reclaim and split condenser valves are part of a complete head pressure control package. Now, in case you hear papers rustling around in the background, that's not me using a script to do this. We're trained professionals, so we don't need that. Just say it. <laughs> so here's the three-way heat reclaim valve. We've got a cutaway of this. And, and, and during the refrigeration process, some people look at that as a cooling thing, but it's really a heat transfer effect. And it's transfer, transferred from a place where it might be considered objectionable like the place you're trying to cool a freeze to a place where it can simply be rejected, like the great outdoors. But rather than simply rejecting that transfer heat and wasting it, it can sometimes be used for another purpose. By utilizing something like a three-way heat reclaim valve, that otherwise wasted heat and energy can be redirected to provide supplemental store heat or to preheat water. Great idea. Yeah. I love it. And, and, and not and not heat hot water, but heat, you know, cool water. Right. You know, they always say hot water heater, but, you know, hot water doesn't need to be heated. Uh, refrigerant that would be, that should be bled from that reclaim valve or the condenser coil in some instance to the suction side of the system when it's not in use. Uh, Three-way valves with internal bleeds can bleed the refrigerant from that idle condenser. Or you can use an auxiliary side solenoid valve and restrictor and check valve as an optional method. All good ways for us to come up with products to sell you. That's right. right. And gotta love it. Gotta love it. And so here we're kind of depicting that system in actual in an actual installation. Well, I guess that's not an actual installation, that's just a schematic. A schematic. Right. So I lied there. Can be. So when reclaimed heat is required that three-way solenoid valve gets energized. That's this thing right here. I'm using my cursor to point that out. Hopefully you all can see that. This then sends refrigerant through the reclamation heat exchanger. In this case, that's a water heater. That's this guy over here, right? Make sense? And then on to the normal condenser. That's the normal condenser. I guess that's opposed to an abnormal condenser. In the series arrangement, and this is a series arrangement of condensers, the water heater desuperheats the refrigerant and the condensing process actually occurs in a normal condenser. Uh, we don't want refrigerant to condense in the water heater and why not, you'd ask. Uh, in the series arrangement, refrigerant always flows through the normal, normal condenser and when the reclaim coil is idle, trapped refrigerant should be bled to the suction line uh, to be utilized in the remaining parts of the system. That's, that's what's depicted here with this normally open solenoid valve, the restrictor right here, by the way, we'll sell that to you. It's part number 249-004. You know, we maybe ought to include a picture of this on here. Would you send these folks a application to be a, you know, send us a PO or something, I don't know. And then a check valve. The check valve should be used in the reclaim pump out or bleed line whenever the uh, reclaimed heat exchanger is exposed to temperatures lower than the saturated suction temperature of the system. Uh, this will help prevent refrigerant migration to the coldest location in the system, which very well could be that coil. You don't right. want that to happen. That's right. 
this depicts heat reclaim with parallel condensers. When piped in parallel, the heat reclaim, you know, parallel is one of those words I almost can't say. Say mm -hmm. parallel, parallel three times, three parallel, times. parallel, parallel, That's parallel. Right. Very good. Yeah, I'd get that. I get that right. Didn't good, good, the yeah. heat the heat reclaim coil must be large enough to fully condense the refrigerant on the high side, because the heat reclaim valve is a solenoid style product. It actually shifts as opposed to modulates. Is that saying that modulating valves are smarter than solenoid valves? Is that what that's trying to say? I guess maybe I it is. Yeah, and a hundred percent of the system refrigerant will go to one coil or the other. I just got to. Recall the idle coil should be drained of refrigerant either by using an auxiliary solenoid valve or the optional internal bleed feature of the B version three way heat reclaim valve. We've got a B version of the heat reclaim valve? Yeah, the B, B version is the bleed out, so you can bleed out the reclaim condenser when it's idle. So you so, can get the refrigerant back to the suction and back into the system rather than using a normally open solenoid valve at the other uh, the reclaim condenser. That sounds complicated. It, it's not too bad. I mean, if I was buying, I think I'd want the A version of something, you know, I don't want necessarily the, the B version. version. Yeah. It sounds like I'm getting a factory second or something. Well, the, okay, but well, the B version stands for bleed. So that's got it. Not for bleed, not yeah. for second class. No, that's right. Got it. So the B version is only capable probably of bleeding one condenser coil back to the suction. That's side. correct. In this case, it would be the reclaim condenser. All right, and so then if you're going to do that, you might also need uh, for that remaining condenser an auxiliary solenoid to bleed the refrigerant when that right. coil's idle. Right. Does that so make sense? Normal, when it's in piped in parallel with the normal condenser, you'll need, when that's idle, you need to bleed that out. And typically they use a normally closed solenoid because more often than not. That's this one right here. That's correct. Everybody ought to be able to see that if they're paying attention. That's right. Okay. And then, more often than not, the normal condenser is. Uh, going to be running most of the time, so you really don't need to have a normally open Got it. solenoid valve. So a normal condenser, normally closed solenoid oh, yeah. valve, reclaimed condenser, normally open solenoid uh, valve. If you if you got a B as a boy version of the heat reclaimed valve, then you don't need to normally open solenoid valve. Got it. Valve. And then down Possibly. here. Possibly. Yeah. We got the restrictors in both lines. Right. And then you got a check valve in this line. If you wanted to be really conservative, you could put a check valve over here. but. Correct. Probably wouldn't typically, need one there. Typically, it's not not used, but it can. It's optional. Here, we're taking a look at troubleshooting heat reclaim. Uh, dirt. I got to just say, from my experience with all this stuff, dirt and contamination is ultimately one of the biggest system problems that can occur. Would you agree with that, Mr. Echelkamp? I would agree. That's the main cause of a lot of things. Because the pilot port up above where you see the piston and the uh, internal parts of the valve up above is the pilot ports and some of those ports are get a little small. Gotcha. It's, that's not a short joke, is it? It's not a short okay, joke. Okay, all right, just making sure. But, but if the valve is stuck and it won't shift, that could be the, that the bleed line or the pilot might be restricted with junk. Uh, could be the solenoid has got an issue with that. Now keep in mind, we need a 50 PSI differential between the discharge and the suction for these for these valves to function properly. Uh, if the heat reclaim output is low, maybe the head pressure is low, you know, and that would further the reason for head pressure control, which we're going to talk about later. Yep. And mm -hmm, yep, we put a plug in that for already. That's maybe right. the people have already forgot, but we'll remind them. Oh, we will several okay. times. Yeah. And then flash gas at the TV inlet. You know, possible refrigerant leak causing low receiver level. Uh, you could deactivate the reclaim as a temporary fix. And, and you know, if there's a refrigerant leak, if there's a refrigerant leak, maybe you'd fix the leak. Okay. Rock and roll time. We can. Yeah, they just somebody just stepped in and said Jim Echo Camp needs to be louder. So I guess I better be a little bit louder. Oh, Talk wow. a little bit louder on the mic. So we're oh, fine. Okay. All right. I didn't I didn't understand the sign language of that. Well, I tell you what, somebody comes in to me while I'm doing a presentation, they're gonna get in trouble. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> so here we go. All's good. All good. So here we go. High side components, the 
split condenser. We're going to move on to split condenser valves. That sounds more dynamic if I split the condenser than if I just reclaim some heat. But yeah. uh, during the winter or off season conditions, the whole system works can work a little better. The compressor, the condenser, uh, efficiencies increase and in you know, the full condenser capacity might not be required to keep this system alive and doing what it needs to do, uh, especially on a day like today, like we have in the Midwest where it's 15 degrees. And uh, the split condenser valve could be used to effectively reduce the size of the condenser and better match the load. Like we said, part of the overall head pressure control package. I have just got some indication that we might have a question. We have a question over there, Mr. Echocamp. Let's see, it has been my experience over, it's been my experience over many, many years that a reclaimed condenser should never be sized to fully condensed before it returns to the rooftop condenser. I believe I understood you to say that the reclaimed condenser should fully condensate before return. Is that a correct statement or did you err in your ways? I believe we may have erred or maybe a misunderstanding, but uh, you are correct. Uh, the reclaimed condenser should not be sized to fully condensate before it returns to the rooftop condenser. Oh, sure. We got somebody paying attention out there. That's right. What the heck? That's right. Yeah. Well. So well, thank thanks. you for the comment. Yeah, you betcha. Question. We'll have to. We'll have to go back and see if. Uh, we'll have to go back and check out the recording to see if I did. Uh, I'd say something. I got to be careful what I say. You know, or nearly I'd say screw up. I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> Besides the weather conditions have an impact on, on system operation, you know, there's a number of factors that affect condenser capacity. And the temperature difference, the difference between the air temperature and the refrigerant temperature and the condenser capacity, you know, that condenser capacity is going to increase with that so-called TD. And the TD increases as the ambient falls, just like the day, like we've got in the Midwest where it's, Shoot, you don't need your refrigeration system. You just move everything out on the parking lot right. and let it let it stay frozen out there. Um, so less heat may need to be rejected through the condenser. <coughs> uh, in the case of that, is the ambient falls. Another thing, airflow. You know, in the old days, you used to use two-speed motors, or you just cycle them off to help control the air side capacity across a across a condenser. Uh, but today, we got you know the availability of variable frequency drives, inverter drives, as they're sometimes called. Uh, fan cycle switches are used to decrease airflow and optimize condenser efficiency, uh, all in an attempt to do a better job of controlling head pressure. Coil size, that split condenser arrangement and hold back valve change the condenser's effective surface area. All good things. Here's a plug again for our December 18th, you, you know, because we're going to talk just briefly about head pressure control. So here's a little teaser. Typical design sequences will cycle fans, modulate fan speed, maybe split condensers, or perhaps even include a combination of all these options in order to maintain the high side pressure. Keep in mind at low ambient temperatures, fan control alone may not adequately control condenser head pressure. And the, and, the, and the darn things can get iced up, you know, if you're relying strictly on, on air side control. So it's maybe a combination of all that that makes the best, best package. Refrigerant side controls like hold back and bypass valves generally become a necessary item uh, at these lower temperatures. But there's more on that later. We're even going to talk about... Oh, we're going to talk about the electric... Electric operated uh, three-way valve, the MTW, which stands for modulating three-way valve. Yeah, we might even talk. We'll have to get somebody smarter than me in here, uh, though, to talk about that then. I think if we arm you with the correct information, I think you could do a maybe, fine maybe job. Maybe I could do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, well, maybe I am a super senior. That's right. In here, which means, you know, what happens as you get older, you know, the, the hair either turns gray or it turns loose. Mm -hmm. you, you know, another bad thing that happens with it wherever it lands, it tends to take root. You know, I'm just saying. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. The three-way split, 
I, I could have done something like, you know, a yeah. horse walks into a bar, yeah. but I can't tell that one this time. No. Uh, the three-way split condenser valve is a relatively simple modification of the standard heat reclaim valve. And here we're, we're going to go through a little bit of the operation. Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a difficult thing. From the exterior, split condenser valves and heat reclaim valves look almost the same. And, and, and here we got a little animation going on where we're showing the bleed action there. Is that what's going on here? With that, I'll back back up and show it again. Look at that. You're showing isn't that, isn't that neat? On the left circled one, you're showing the pilot valve when it's energized and de-energized in the position it's in. Isn't that special? I didn't know we could do that stuff with these slide presentations. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Whoops, let's back that up a minute because I'm not done talking about this one. So, you know, one of the things that we have done to help you differentiate between heat reclaim and a split condenser valve is we add these nice little nameplates on top of the coil housing, right? That's correct. But everybody takes those off when they're installing the darn things and then they throw them in a pile and they inevitably, no, not everybody. If, if I was doing it, if I was doing it, I'd put the wrong one back on. They don't the want to do that. I um, mean, you know, or I'd lose them. You know, I used to, used to think if you'd lock me in a room with two steel balls, I'd lose one and tear the other one up. But if I was putting these back on these coils, I'd probably mess that up. Yeah. And so if you're trying to determine which one you have, what else do you do? Well, we emboss or impress the letters SC for split condenser on the body of the split condenser version to help you determine which one of these you have. When, when de-energized, the three-way split condenser valve can divert or split refrigerant flow to two condenser circuits during the summer operation. And that's kind of considered normal or full condenser mode. It can divert flow in this manner because the upper seat or port of the valve opens and closes. While that lower port, now this is this is this is crazy. This lower port down here? That's correct. That's always open? That's always open. Why what the heck? It's always open. It's always open. So the only thing that closes off is this upper port. Upper port for this. For I the didn't summer, know that. The summer condenser. So yeah. during Normal full condenser mode, the refrigerant flow is split evenly between the two halves of the condenser. However, when it's energized, the valve shifts, right? right. Shifts, because it's a solenoid valve, it's either open and closed kind of deal. It shifts and diverts all flow to the summer winter condenser. That's correct. Is that how this works? That's how it works. That's pretty easy. That's pretty slick. Even I can understand that. Now, the important thing is that for the nameplate and the SC stamping on the body is to make sure you to differentiate that between that and the regular three-way heat reclaim valve because just looking at them side by side they look the same but they're not and internally interchangeable. internally they're different and they're not interchangeable yeah right. and you can't turn one into the other can you nope 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 I, that's kind of what i thought okay. so here's the split condenser three-way valve schematic this depicts, oh, here's that B version you were talking about That's earlier. the B version. So there's a 12D13B-SC, SC split condenser. Right. And That's then this right. shows that bleed or drain back to the suction header. That's right. Yep. So when, when the summer only condenser becomes idle, the trapped refrigerant needs to be drained or removed. That's correct. And that would allow that to happen. Now it's important that you get all that drained out of there. If you do happen, for some reason, switch uh, back into that mode to reclaim or the summer condenser mode too fast and it's not completely pumped out, yeah. you may have a lot of hot gas from the discharge line entering that condenser with the liquid in it and you'll get what's called condensation induced shock. And it- uh, As opposed to electrical it, it shock. Wakes, <laughs> that's correct. It, it wakes you up, that's for sure. Hey, we so, got another question. Yeah, so the question is, is so is the heat reclaim valve stamped as well? There's there's no stamping with SC on there. Uh, <laughs> okay. On that one. That one but, uh, uh, but there's nothing that indicates on the body that it's a heat reclaim valve. That's correct. So that's correct. you're going to rely on the nameplate on top of the coil being that's correctly right. affixed. That's right. And there's no stamping SC on the heat reclaim valve. Okay, so there's no SC on the heat reclaim valve, but there's no... HR. Oh, wait a minute. Boy, wouldn't life be different if there was no HR? Yeah. <laughs> but that's a whole different story now. Boy, that's for sure. 
in, in this example, that track liquid, we kind of got off track there for a minute, yes, didn't we? Did. Yeah, yeah, it's your fault. It's, I know. It's completely your fault because I'm straight and narrow all the time. Yeah, okay. So in this example, because we got the bleed version, we're using that to drain refrigerant back to the suction side as opposed to installing an additional solenoid valve or restrictor in a check valve, right? That correct. accomplishes all of that. That's correct. I don't know if that's a good idea for us to offer that. Maybe if we do it the other way, we'd sell them a split condenser valve, we'd sell them a solenoid valve, we'd sell a restrictor, we'd sell a check valve. I kind of like that idea. Yeah. Regarding so, check valves, it's a good practice to install that check valve at the condenser outlet to prevent charge migration to the idle coil. Is that what we're showing here? That's it. Yeah, up here, if you're paying attention to my little cursor. Yep, yep, yep. And, and in order to provide equal flow by influencing pressure drop, we've got two check valves there. Uh, uh, one on the summer winter condenser outlet as well. That's great. And that's the reason for that. Gosh, another way for us to sell more stuff. Now, just as a continued little teaser, we are depicting the condenser holdback valve here indicated by an A8, which is a Flocon style product, pressure regulating valve. And pressure regulating valves just control pressure. You know, that's all they do. And then down here, we got another pressure regulating valve that would pressurize the receiver, A9. And so these two valves are part of the head pressure control package that we're going to talk about. Yeah, on uh, December 18th. Yeah, I think it's December 18th. All right. Yep. Now, not saying anything would go wrong, but there is the possibility that if we built up ice on the pilot connection, that it might cause uh, some malfunction, right? So, you know, constant bleed back to suction, you might have possibly some leakage through that check valve. That, those are two things that could potentially happen from a troubleshooting perspective that you would want to uncover if you're having some problems. Now, rebuilding three-way valves. Hmm. Isn't that an interesting thing? You know, elastomer seals, and we do use O-rings on occasion, that can swell in the presence of refrigerant and oil. Boy, I could make some comments about that, but I'm just not going to. Uh, when refrigerant is removed and replaced with a substitute refrigerant, O-rings can typically not re-swell to the original size. What That might mean that you end up with a leak if it's a final seal. That's correct. If the elastomer seal is used as that final seal, you might have a leak pass. For this reason, three-way valves should be considered when retrofitting refrigerants. So here's something to keep in mind. Uh, 8D and 12D are currently non-hermetic in their design. We're gonna show you a little bit more about that here shortly. The 16D is hermetic. Correct. And that means, what is that? What's her, that's a big word, that's like, it's like adiabatic or isometric or something like that. So hermet, what's hermetic mean? And the three and the 16D means you're not gonna be able to take the internal parts out or switch them around. Ah. You can change the pilot assembly, but that's it. So if you got a malfunctioning valve that you consider is plugged up or whatever, you might just have to replace it. Replace the whole valve with the 16D, that's correct. So that, that I guess that's a, that means that if you got an 8D or 12D, you'd simply replace those uh, uh, our, 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 Depends on how it's piped. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier to replace the whole valve, and other times they're in a situation where you can't get get around it, so you may have to change the internal parts. Okay. Well, here we see, you know, we've we've given you a little bit of information. The 8D and the 12D, you can get in a closing tube kit. We got a part number there for it. The pilot assembly gasket prior to that date code. Now 3-00. Prior to 3-00, does that mean the third month of, of the year 2000? Is that what that means right up here? Yeah, the 3-00 would be March 2000, the year Got 2000. It. And then the pilot assembly gasket, same deal. We've we converted that to a so-called Wolverine product, right? Looks like. And then the lower body O-ring. Uh, keep in mind, you know, if you're attempting to rebuild a three-way valve, you know, it can involve a lot of labor. You got to isolate the valve from system pressure, make sure you do this in a safe manner. You got to cut the valve out of the system. You got to disassemble it and then you got to rebuild it. And then you got to rebraze it into the system. You know, that can take a lot of time and money. Maybe it doesn't make sense to do that. You have to evaluate each situation. So 
possibly we may get a chance to sell you another valve. That's right. Yeah. Boy, we just come up with all kinds of ways to do that. Split condenser. This shows a system without those fancy three-way valves. What's going on here? It looks like I've heard that some supermarkets prefer that they use two normally open solenoid valves in lieu of that fancy three-way split condenser valve like you see here. There's a normally open solenoid. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This looks like dummy. I mean, and then we got a normally open solenoid valve that's operating. That's kind of interesting that we do that. Uh, I think that has something to do with balancing the flow via pressure drop. I mean, we come up with another correct. way to sell two valves and only one of them has to work. That's correct. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, you want to balance the flow. That's what you got to, you have yeah. to have. Yeah. In this application, though, we're still using that auxiliary solenoid valve to bleed refrigerant from the idle condenser. That's what's going on right here. That's correct. Okay. And then here, I mean, still got the check valve. We got uh, a solenoid valve here for pump out when idled, but this has got some fancy designation, an XSP. Does that stand for extra spoil and part? That's <laughs> sure, true. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, again, we depicting the A8 and A9 valves in this application because we're going on a premise that it's, this is industrial size equipment that would mandate the need for those kind of products. And again, we're going to talk about head pressure yeah, a little the later. X, the X, uh, one, one point about the XSP-10, it's normally closed, but it does have an orifice in it. Uh, oh, so you don't need a, you don't need that extra restrictor then if you use this. So the, the, you got a cell light valve and a restrictor all in one. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, you know, like they say, a picture paints a thousand text messages. Here, we're showing some recommended valve orientations. If you want, you know, these are still, they might be have three connections on them, but they're still a solenoid valve. That's correct. So they're, they're, they're influenced by the impact of gravity. So it makes sense to position that valve to help offset the impact, the effects that that would have on it. So you'd see two green check marks in the orientations that we'd recommend. And then you see this red X highlighted down here in ways that, of course, this would probably be the way I'd put it in, you know. Uh, You'd be changing it. I'd be changing it because it wouldn't work. Okay. All good. Yeah, we don't want to let oil and contamination get inside that enclosing tube either. So that's another reason another not reason. to install them in these kind of positions. That's correct. Now, I know in our installation instructors, we talk about vertical and horizontal orientations, but you know, sometimes people can get confused by that. So that's why we've depicted it as we have here on this slide. Helps to, like I said, picture paints a thousand text messages. Huh? That's pretty funny too. I thought that was funny. Ah, and then just to reiterate the fact that three-way valves can appear very similar. And that's why we've done things like created bulletin 30-20, bulletin 30-21, which gives you a lot of info to supplement what we're telling you here. And unfortunately, there's practically no interchangeable parts between the two different style of valves. But we have done a really nice job of developing a bulletin 122 for parts. And in fact, We've had some of our really smart people here, which excludes me, I think, updated Bulletin 122, and it's a new version. It's got a lot of good information in it. It does. It's, it's, uh, we use that a lot even here with, in the office here when we get a lot of tech support questions. Uh, keep in mind that, that, that label and nameplate on the coil includes all the appropriate description if you'd need to replace the valve. Um, Again, sometimes that's not always fitted where it needs to be. And, and again, thankfully, we impressed the SC on the split condenser version of the valve. And that's, that's a permanent affixment to the valve. And so, again, see the bulletins for more information. And just to keep this slide from being so darn boring, we've added uh, images of two different valve styles. We've got one here. This brass version is a is a B5D, if I'm not mistaken. That's and correct. B in this case stands for brass. brass. The first B does. Got it. And in this case, we've got a 16D. 
And this is an example of a hermetic valve. Correct. Actually, these are both hermetic valves. I got it. I got it. We have a question here that somebody's asked, going back to the XSP10. They don't recall seeing literature. Is, are these relatively new? And the answer is yes, they're relatively new. And we don't have a lot of literature out at this time, but it's a, it's a small, normally closed solenoid valve with the uh, 0.031 inch orifice at the outlet and uh well that's way back to here. get go go forward did i pass it up yes boy you just can't trust me to there drive this thing there it is yeah. it's hiding right there that's it there it is okay there yeah. there's a literature you contact on. you know if you need information tech you support contact tech support absolutely good question let's get back on track here I went too far. Here we go. Three bay valves, limitations. We always get questions about this kind of stuff. You know, what's the maximum pressure? What's the maximum temperature that these valves can withstand and tolerate? And here in this instance, the ambient temperature you see can vary from as low as minus 40 degrees F to as high as 120. And then the fluid or refrigerant temperature can vary from as low as minus 40F to a high of 240. And then in the case of 8D, 12D, and 16D valves, the maximum operating pressure differential, or MOPD, is 300 PSI. Uh, the MRP is 450 PSI. Now, those are reasonably respectable numbers and are suitable for most refrigerants, but just not for 10A. That's why we've got the B5D over here, where the MOPD is considerably higher at 400 PSI, the MRP at 650 was up there in the range where we can handle 410A as well as other refrigerants. And then, of course, we've got the 8D and 12D HP versions, and that HP doesn't stand for horsepower here, does it, Jim? It stands for high pressure. High pressure. It right. doesn't stand for heat pump. Ah, that, that's, yeah. Get a lot of those questions. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. So high pressure. And we use that designation on a fair number of our products that are suitable for use with our 410A. Three-way valves, typical malfunctions. Now this is an exciting slide. Look at all the information we got on this. Coil burnout. I guess that coil's on fire. Had to call the fire department and put it out, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what they're talking about. No, here. that's right. What's coil burnout? Coil burnout? Yeah, what's that? I'm, I'm, is that a coil got tired of its job and it doesn't want to show up anymore? Get burned out. Yeah, it's kind of like you and me. We're kind of burned out. Or is it something else? What's coil it's burnout? It's usually overheating, typically, because you put the wrong voltage to the coil. Ah. Putting 120 volt to 24 volt coil is not a good idea. So it's important when you're replacing components to have the right one to go back in. That's correct. Is that right? Okay. So what's it? Failure to shift to reclaim mode, failure to shift to normal mode. Is that kind of like a millennial in front of us, in, in behind the wheel of a stick shift car? Failure to shift? Is that what that is? Yeah. Okay. I guess that could be debris. That could be a number of things that oh, could yes. contribute yes. that. Not enough uh, pressure. Ah, that 50 Either PSI 50 differential PSI. that's got to exist, right? Got to exist as well. We have a couple of live questions here. Oh, we have questions? Yes. Is that is that opposed to dead questions? That's correct. These okay, are what are the questions? questions? Why do you use a 5 16 flare on 16D valves? Makes it difficult to repair. Uh, you know, typically they should be quarter inch or three eighths. Now, on the newer pilots on a 16D, they are they are quarter inch flares. So that should be re resolved with the new ones. The uh, the other question is, uh, are any refrigerants not approved for use with these valves? Uh, I'll go back here to one slide back. You got to be careful. Yes. 410A would be a case in point. We've got some valves that are capable of handling 410A. Right. I guess another thing that you'd need to be careful if, you know, uh, if the systems has a, can't imagine you'd run into a hydrocarbon with this kind of equipment, but that would be an issue. Yeah. Yes, hydrocarbon based propane, refrigerant. Uh, refrigerant 290. Uh, the, uh, yeah, but can't imagine you, I mean, with the charge limitations, you're not going to encounter that. Ammonia, uh, you yeah, know, you, 
these these types of valves are uh, because of copper and brass. Can't use them on ammonia. Can't use them on ammonia. Yeah, I, I guess from a practical standpoint, 410A would constitute the application that you need to be concerned about. And in most supermarket applications on the refrigeration side, probably not going to encounter that. Right. But you need to be careful of, yeah. mindful of that. But it, uh, these valves can handle almost all the typical refrigerants. If you get a you get an odd odd refrigerant that you're not sure of, again, feel free to call uh, tech support or SVD tech support at parker.com. Yeah, look at this. Oh, lead right into the yeah. slide. That's pretty Squirrel nice. and tech it? support. We got a phone number. We've got people, humans, well, some of them are human, that answer your call if you call. So 636-239-1111, we'll get our receptionists. Um, email to SVD tech support at parker.com. I mean, we we try to stay on top of those. Uh, Sporlin.com is a valuable resource for you for tech support, product literature, training, uh, e-newsletter, product videos, events, new product releases, and virtual engineer, which is our new sizing and selection tool. And most all of this stuff, like our literature and the use of the virtual engineer, how much do they cost for you to use? Your time an internet connection. That's what it costs. We've got a climate control blog on the Parker site. You can follow us on Facebook, Smashbook. Uh, this bird thing kind of looks like a target on the shooting range for bird hunters, but I think that's Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. Yeah, and we got the Sporlin video YouTube channel, so you can stay connected with us. I have a couple more uh, oh, you live got, questions. Yeah, here. yeah, live questions. Yes, we do. Yeah, let's one is uh, is a is there a modulating heat reclaim valve? And the answer is yes. It's called the MTW valves. Yeah, and that we'll talk about that at some other guess, other session. Here. Guess what? Um, and and right before, do you have any more questions or is yeah, that? We it? got a few more. We got a few more. Well, let hang on that just a minute because we're we're kind of starting to run up to our hard stop at one forty five, but. If, if you're viewing this webinar via Zoom, some of you have figured out you can ask us questions. If you haven't asked a question that you have, we have a few more minutes left where we can get to it. If you're viewing the webinar via Facebook Live, you can type the questions in the comments. And just to finally put in that one more plug for the supermarket high side components, head pressure control that we're gonna do on, on December when? December 18th? 18th. Yeah. yeah. And during the course of that, we'll talk about that MTW valve, I would imagine, right? Wouldn't that That's make correct. sense? Yeah. That sounds good. So you got another question in there? Got another question. What about CO2 on uh, the, the dash HP valves? Uh, the uh, secondary, uh, the subcritical CO2 oh. systems can use the dash HP valves, but not the transcritical. Gotcha. I don't have anything for transcript. The MRP and the MOPD on those yeah. valves on the HP versions is substantial enough to right. handle subcritical CO2. And most subcritical. There, there are some subcriticals that ex go into the uh, maybe 800, 750 to 800 pounds of pressure that it exceeds it. That exceeds it. So you got to watch the MRP and the uh, MOPD of the valve. Ah, so you're telling me you've got to be cautious and think this through. And if you got any questions, you could always call tech support or you can send us an email and we'll respond to you. That's correct. We have, any, have to just tell, say at this point that I want to thank you for joining Chill Skills Orland Tech Talk on supermarket high side components, three way heat reclaim, and split condenser valves. I guess you could call this part one. We didn't call it that, but you could. And I want to just continue to thank you for joining us there. And that's the end. If we've got, any, we've got a few more minutes, if there's any other questions, you can pose them to us. We'll try to answer them. Uh, if we don't have the answer, we'll make something up. Yeah, here's, here's a question. Only twice I have the strainer in the bleed line be full of solder. So mm. I guess that's a comment. Only twice I had the strainer in the bleed line be full of solder. So you've got to uh. be careful when you install that. Yeah, sure uh, use a zoom lock fit. Because then that... So. Uh, yeah, on the, on the uh, restrictor, it is small. If you do have a strainer upstream of it, 
the strainer gets clogged. Yeah. yeah, that 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 is a problem. Hammer handles sure. and lunch boxes get you every time flowing through there. You know. Correct. Yeah. Do we, do we uh, have any other questions? Well, we do. We do have one more. One more question. We got time for one or two more questions, and then then we're going to sign off. What do we got here, Jim? Let's see. Why do we have the bleed? Why do we have to bleed the condenser? We aren't using, you know, like the summer condenser and a split condenser system. Okay. You want to pump out all the idle, idle uh, liquid sure. in the uh, in the idle condenser so that you don't have the uh, potential condensation induced shock when you inject oh. hot gas when you shift into that mode. Got it. Because uh, that will shake, rattle, and roll. And you break stuff. And you could break uh, you, you elbows could, and things like you that. You could break, you, and if you've got any part of the system that might be dubious and how well it was put together, you could you could break a line. That's correct. That's correct. Got any other questions? Yeah, we got, uh, how do we ensure there's not condensing in a hot water heater? Uh, that's a good question. That's in the design of, of the system, I guess. And yeah, and would that be the water heater that that's a different water heater that's a hot water heater as opposed to a cold heater. water heater yeah this would be that so that would be the uh reclaim condenser mode so but, does that fall back to the design of the condenser itself or that heat exchanger itself would that, I think that so. yes that come into play with that yes we got time for one more question do you recommend to replace the three-way valve with burned out compressor uh, I, I actually, I don't think a burned out compressor would work in place of a three-way valve, but I think that's not what he meant. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty yeah, funny. Yeah. I didn't know. Uh, I'm not familiar with a lot of people changing the three-way valve on a compressor burnout. I think you can use the proper cleanup methods. Yeah. It, it does a pretty good job. You can use that three-way valve. Yeah. It, it, you would have to diagnose that more fully to determine if you had any repercussions. That's, that's not part of that's not normally part of the procedure for cleanup following a burnout. Not saying that it might not be required, but it's just not norm, not normally part of it. Yeah, typically, typically that's that's not an issue. Okay. Well, we might squeeze one last question in if we have any more. All right. You can continue to post questions like we talked about on on uh, you know the different sources and avenues that we discussed. I will. Uh, We'll respond to those questions. I'm going to just leave this slide up for just a minute here while we sign out and we thank you all for joining us. Hope you'll join us again for the next time that we do this, which is going to be on December 18th. All right. Where we talk more about head pressure control. Thank you again. You're supposed to say bye. Okay. Have a great day. Yeah. Have a great day. Good night. Good weekend.